weiter. Don muss ganz kurz noch sein Mikrofon suchen gehen, holen. Es geht natürlich weiter mit Rennen, es geht weiter mit Persönlichkeiten und jetzt geht es aber nicht so sehr um Technik, trotzdem aber um eine große Herausforderung, nämlich das Golden Globe Race. Genauso alt wie die Boot, kann man sagen, ist das ganze Rennen und es gibt jetzt eine Neuauflage. Ich begrüße herzlich auf der Bühne Don McIntyre. Welcome on stage. Hopefully it will work after we saw the video. We will start with a short entrance and we see Susie here. It all starts with the family checks. All very gentle though. Not that we really remember it. That's in the photos. Me and my brothers were up sailing. It's always been there, it's kind of always been a part of my life. In school it was, what do you want to do when you grow up kind of thing. My thing was always like, I want to sail around the world. It was sort of this far away idea which was kind of impossible. And then I think I was like 11, 12 or something when Ellie MacArthur did her Around the World in the modern day. Before that, it was all older chaps doing it, these salty sea dogs. And then you've got this tiny little woman doing it, and I thought, wow, she can do it. Others can do it, and I want to do it. The original Golden Globe sparked off sort of the whole the yachting industry the way it is today, like the Bondi Globe and the BOC Challenge and these Around the World races, but this uh, 2018 Golden Globe is only the second ever. So the first person to finish will only be the second person to have gone around solo non-stop without GPS and tiny little boats and one person the boat in the ocean. Navigation wise it's paper charts, sextant, sun, stars, planets, horizon, as opposed to chart plotters and GPS. Which makes it even more of a challenge because we've come such a long way with modern technology it's in some ways seemed a bit alien you know going back back in time it's not that i'm thinking of it as a 30,000 mile voyage i mean it is but it's broken up into bite-sized chunks if you like the capes the equator sounds simple than that <laughs> I've been in storms at sea before, but probably not like one that I'll get in the Southern Ocean. It's notorious for the size of swell and the storms that you get through there. I'm sure there'll be times down there where I just think, what the hell am I doing? This is horrendous. The boat is just like a rag doll. It's been chucked around all over the place and you can do nothing about it. <laughs> you can't be on deck, you can't do anything up there because it's just too dangerous. The safest bet is to kind of lash everything down, batten down the hatches and get below and stay warm. Try to kind of think of calmer times, nice things, and just ride out the storm. The boat on a ship like this is everything. The boat, oh God, she's Russell 36. It did like 8,000 miles or something this winter, which Revealed a few little nasty things about her. Leaks a lot. Filthy fuel tank and lots of little things that are really, really annoying, which are all being sorted now. A boat needs attention, whether it's a new boat or an old boat. There'll always be little things that crop up. You can't let sort of minor little jobs pile up. Anything breaks, you fix it straight away because without a boat, that is 100%. You're not going to get around the world. The biggest challenge in this race, I think, is mental challenge. There is obviously a, a level of physical fitness, but it's not the same level as your mental fitness. I think that's way more important. On your own for nine months, you don't know one to talk to, you're just battling with your own mind. So if you can get around in your head, then I think you can get around the world. The race isn't for everyone. It's mentally tough, it's physically tough, it's exhausting, it's draining. It's just going to push you to your absolute limits, to your max. And that's what appeals about it in some weird kind of way. 
the pure challenge, the raw adventure of just you, your boat, and the ocean. You, your boat, and the ocean. Done. This is a special edition of racing, and it's uh, also a very special way of racing, not racing up to high techniques, high materials, but it's a kind of old school racing and this has a long history. Can you tell us a bit about the history of the Golden Globe? Okay, it goes back to 1968 and one year before that in 1997 Sir Francis Chichester completed a one-stop uh, solo circumnavigation and then sailors around the world started to think about what's next. The only thing was a non-stop. So in 68 there were uh, uh, nine starters in a voyage around the world and uh, only one finished, and that was Sir Robert Knox Johnson in a boat called Suhaley. Many people remember Donald Crowhurst in a trimaran that tried to fool the world with false uh, radio reports. A famous Frenchman, Bernard Matessier in Joshua, he went round as well. So Robin went around in uh, 100, uh, 312 days. It was nearly 10 months, and uh, uh, it was an epic story. Uh, it was the era when man first landed on the moon, so it was quite some time ago, okay? And uh, yeah, there's a lot of things happen, you know. I actually, there was this film about the cheating and the radio, uh, radio uh, podcast and yeah. uh, interviews. And uh, I was wondering if, if, I don't know, maybe some of you did see the film uh, lately. I was wondering how uh, do you have to be to do this, to do the racing, to say, okay, I will stand with this. We just heard. Uh, the girl here talking about the mental state of racing. Yeah, it, it, I mean, you've got, to, you've got to really passionately want to do it. But, but the big thing is, most people know about solo around the world racing, and there's not a, not a current venue for the average sailor, okay? You need millions of dollars if you're gonna do a Vendee Globe, and you're very professional. This is something for ordinary sailors, okay? And the boats that we're using are achievable, like 30, 32 to 36 foot long, they're from a different era. Uh, long keel rudder on the, on the back, very proven ocean going boats. And so it's available to any sailor, okay? But the first decision to make is whether they really want to do it. And the thing, the only thing that'll get you around is that passion and that drive to say, I've just got to do this. And that's where it's the mind. That's number one on the list. It's not just the boat or uh, just the challenge. It's all up here, you know. Okay, let's uh, introduce the race a little more. You just said, and we see it here on the pics, that uh, this is boats that are achievable. It's kind of old school boats, not high technique boats, not the... Yeah, in fact, that's, that's Joshua. That's uh, Bernard Matessi's original boat. And it's right alongside Sue Haley there, which is Sir Robin Knox Johnson's boat. That was the first time they'd actually been together. This was in La Sable alone at the start of the race. And uh, yeah, this is a, a whole new addition and it, it's uh, uh, an incredible opportunity. And it's a classic adventure with an unknown outcome. You know, no one knew at that stage what was going to happen. What drove you to the idea to uh, to do this race again? Well I was actually uh, a big fan, in fact Robin Knox Johnson was an inspiration to many sailors including myself when I was a kid. I, I eventually got to meet him uh, in 1982 in the first of BOC Challenge and uh, that was an inspiring moment uh, doing different adventures. I thought I'd like to do a solo round the world race. I did the BOC Challenge in 1990 and then uh, from there, when I saw the uh, anniversary of the 50th edition, I wanted to go again. And so I thought, if I want to do it, some others might want to join me. But when I do it this time, I want it to be a simple boat using a sextant, no technology, going back to exactly the same as what it was in 1968. It's a very uh, real challenge then. And it also, it's a lot cheaper, it's a lot less money. So uh, because I wanted to do it, thought I'd have a race and uh, a few people might want to join me. And in reality, it went nuts. As soon as we announced the race, we were swamped with applications and interest and so on. That was in, in 2015. That's crazy, especially when I, I'm thinking about the navigation and uh, you have to know the stars. How many of you still know how to navigate by stars? No, not ah, many. Oh, there yeah. we go, you got a couple there. <laughs> Lucky you, huh? Yeah, but there's a great satisfaction in that too. It's really satisfying when you actually are taking celestial sights and doing a fix and carrying on. So. Uh, it, it's an old school thing, but it's it's a it's a nice thing to do, you know. And there's a resurgence. There's a lot more people getting back into celestial navigation. And somehow it's stepping back. Maybe uh, 
get closer to original sailing someone might Absolutely. say yeah we, we we've got a i mean obviously you know we all love the vonday globe we love the volvo you know we love the altons all that high technology stuff it's incredible but with the golden globe with ordinary boats and ordinary sailors that want to really push themselves and take a challenge there's a whole undercurrent of followers that we have now all over the world we go into 50 countries following the race it's, it's quite substantial and it's all the ordinary sailors that can relate to these boats they can say geez i could buy that boat or they've already got one similar so you know i could get around the world and now the interest is growing quite rapidly for the next edition but that's another story how do you select who can take uh, part of this race who can well, we, be part of it yeah there is an application process obviously it's by invitation only but they have to have a minimum level of sailing experience like for the next edition you have to have at least 4,000 ocean miles before you can even apply but then you have to have a total of 10,000 ocean miles before the start which includes a few thousand solo miles apart from that's anyone we we age is just a number you know we've got uh, people uh, Jean-Luc Van den Heed in the current edition he's 74 73 this is his uh, sixth solo circumnavigation uh, Susie was 20 28 you know so uh, it's a whole different age bracket. It's a complete mix of uh, backgrounds of people. You know, fully professional guys. You know, Philippe Peche had done 300,000 miles around the world sailing. He was one of the fastest sailors in the world. You know, with the Jules Verne Trophy. Uh, we've got uh, middle of the range sailors like Susie. She's very experienced. Uh, Tommy Abelish from from India. He was um, India's first solo non-stop circumnavigation guy, and he came in. So it's a complete mix of disciplines and people and so on. And countries as well. I was a bit astonished when I read that there's people from India taking yeah. part in this race. I was like, wow, well, I don't know if in any Volvo Ocean race there were people from that. Well, we, we, had, we had entries from 13 countries and quite a massive following. I mean, Ab Tommy uh, Abelish just had a press conference uh, two days ago in India. It went to about 14 million people. It was just phenomenal. He puts a hit up and there's, you know, he's got so many people in India, it's unreal. But yeah, great diversity and it's fantastic. You know, we had a Palestinian entry, uh, but, you know, from just everywhere. It's, uh, because it's an ordinary event, you know, like if someone that uh, wants to do it, this is an opportunity for them to do it. You know. Can you tell us a bit uh, more in detail maybe about the boats? What do they have on board and what okay. do they not have on board? Yeah, first of all, the boats, uh, they have to be between 32 and 36 feet long. Minimum displacement, 6,200 kilos. Uh, they have to have a full keel with an uh, outboard ru uh, rudder attached to the trailing edge of the keel and they have to be designed before 1988 and uh, they have to be a production fiberglass boat right which was uh, out of a female mold uh, the only exception to that you can build a replica of suhaley the original winner all right um, and then uh, there's no no high tech on board no computers no kevlar no carbon fiber uh, no digital anything so you want to take a picture uh, You've got to use a film camera. You want to listen to music, you've got to use a cassette tape player. There's no electric autopilot. It's got to be all wind vane systems. Um, so it's really right back to 1968. In terms of safety, we've got the best of everything. Our safety standards and security arrangements are basically the same as the Vendee Globe or whatever you need there. Um, so it, it's the best of everything for safety. But sailing-wise, it's just one sailor, one boat, basic technology and they've got to get around and it, it, they've got to go a long way <laughs> over yeah. a long time 30,000 miles is, uh, is yeah. the racing track yeah it, it's i mean if you put it into perspective uh, vendee globe is about 72 days okay uh, golden globe is about 240 days or thereabouts you know we think the winners are going to come in shortly and, and uh, they'll arrive at about 218 days um, so it's a long way this is a tough race and uh, it's not just a sprint at all. They're out there for a long time. What did Sir Robin Knox Johnson say? When you uh, came to him up with this idea, yeah. saying, hey, let's do it again. Well, we, we've been friends for 32 years now. And uh, uh, he was absolutely, and before I mentioned it to him, I'd mentioned to a lot of other people and we got the concept right. And I said, Robin, what do you think about this? He just grabbed it, he loves it. Um, he's not officially involved with the GGR, but he's the biggest friend of the GGR that you could imagine. He sees this as the opportunity for all those people that are sitting around the bar and says, oh, I'd love to do this, I'd love to do this, but I can't, or this, that, and the other. Well, guess what? Now you can. And uh, he's been, uh, he's just fantastic. We, um, at the start of the race, uh, in July the 1st, it was very surreal for me. First of all, on two fronts, I wanted to enter the race. I wanted to sail it. It got so big so quick I couldn't. I had to manage the race. 
uh, which was a bit disappointing, but this is now my new adventure. And, and I was on, on board Sir Haley with Sir Robin with his huge cannon starting the race, and it was just very surreal because we were recreating the, the, the event from 50 years ago. It's quite something, and, and Robin just loves it. He follows it quite closely. Talking about dangers a bit, um, if you don't have uh, all those technical equipment on board, um, you might make more mistakes. Is that oh, yeah. true? Yeah, well, I mean, it's not so much make more mistakes, but there's serious challenges. I mean, uh, between the start and Cape Town, we uh, lost about uh, eight boats, I think it was, okay, all retiring for different reasons. The first one went out in about six days, and that was because he basically missed his family and that communication link because you have no communication except for HF radio. He's re-entered for 2022 by the way, <laughs> so he's coming back for the race. Then we had a lot of self-steering issues, you know, self-steering gears were just falling apart and breaking, so three boats got knocked out on self on wind vane issues. Um, we had uh, a, a whole series of things that come down to planning, preparation, execution. You get the planning wrong, it's not going to help you because you make the wrong decisions. Even though you do the preparation, if your planning was wrong, you muck up. And so we lost boats purely for that. And then uh, then we had a classic, uh, our, we lost our first boat with a dismasting, which was RA, uh, about 300 miles southwest of Cape Town. And that was starts from a wind vane problem. The wind vane safety coupling broke, he couldn't steer a hand all the time. He had to hove two while he fixed the wind vane. And he was hove two in 35 knots of wind, three and a half meter seas, and he was rolled over. Okay, which was unbelievable. No one expected that. It wasn't that dramatic a condition. And uh, he lost his mast. And this was RA on a beautifully prepared OE32. You know, incredible rig. He's an experienced sailor. He's been racing 60-foot multi-hulls and monohulls. And we lost him just like that. But he managed to put his jury rig up and sail back to Cape Town. So even the start of the race was quite an adventure because, uh, yeah, a lot of surprises. Is uh, this a, a problem, like losing the mast, a problem of... Uh the old boats, would you say that? Or is it a general no. problem that could happen to everybody? Well, you know, it, it, it happens. And to put it into perspective, you know, these boats, I mean, if we look at the, the next two masts that we lost, we're in one particular storm in the Indian Ocean League. We knew it was a bad storm. I did a live on Facebook about five hours before the peak of it, explaining how dangerous it was. We, the, we tried to route the sailors away from this storm, but we weren't able to. And uh, Tommy's boat was a replica of Suhaili, built incredibly well brand new rigs all designed by one of the biggest names in the world right and uh, Gregor had a Biscay 36 same deal the rig was brand new again designed by very good riggers and uh, Tom, uh, Gregor was the first one to get rolled over he lost his rig and Tommy went shortly after and even with the other Susie who you saw here she lost her rig there was no expense paid on the preparation of that boat the boat was built by some of the best in the world the rig was really it was sponsored by one of the biggest names in the world they knew it was going to the Southern Ocean. They knew it was going to be rolled over. We warned everyone, be ready for rollovers, and yet it was still gone. So everyone's learning from that. So it's not a, not a case of uh, money or anything like that. It's just, wow, this is very interesting. Talking about uh, rolling over, I, uh, I've been once on a Volvo Ocean Racer, and they have these safety boxes in the back. Can you maybe tell us a bit how, how do you prepare for rolling over so does it come all of a sudden and you're like oh whoa what happened to me now well you know that you, you know you're in a storm okay and there's different storm tactics and every sailor's got a different way to approach that safety wise we have all of the uh, grab bags and emergency equipment and so on but generally there's different different issues here um, and i'll bring up jean-luc bandit he's a very famous french sailor he's a hit national hero over there he's got another rustler 36 he was in a storm and his tactic was to keep moving okay keep steerage keep moving that's what he was doing he was pitch pole stern over bow and uh, rolled over at the same time he was towing nothing not going slow he's doing about between five and seven knots um and he didn't lose his rig but he damaged it susie sometime later in the uh, pacific side of the indian ocean same thing she was towing a series drove trying to slow down and she actually did, if you imagine this, if the water is big enough, if the wave is big enough, you can forget what happens. It's just a small boat floating in a bucket of water. If you tip the bucket up, in other words, all the water the boat's flowing in, floating in, you've got a problem. So even if you're going slow, if the boat goes vertical on a big wave, going slow, it's going to go straight down and the wave comes through. And she did a pitch pole rollover as well and she lost her mast. So the storm tactic is a real interesting subject and we're looking at that and hopefully we'll be learning and everyone will 
see the results of some of the surveys. So Robert Knox Johnson is doing a big report on all these sort of issues. So um, there's quite uh, a lot going on. So it's also a race where you can learn a lot. Uh, yeah, the, the objective is to get to the finish. It's a real challenge. It's, uh, you know, people are saying it's the toughest race in the world now because it's uh, so long, it's a lot of endurance and uh, there's a lot of uh, effort on the skipper. It's all down to the skipper. He's got to do everything. There's only one person. They don't have, you know, big support crews doing all these things and uh, it's non-stop. So, you, you, you know, yeah, quite a challenge. And I can also imagine the non-communication is a big issue. Yeah, you're completely isolated. There is satellite phones on board and satellite tweeting, but it's all communication between the organiser and the entrant for safety reasons. We try and route the boats away from storms if there's a big storm coming. But the only communication that they have is single sideband HF radio. So they have to do it all themselves and either talk to national uh, maritime uh, agencies to get weather reports or private networks. Some have got ham radios and uh, they can get their weather reports from there and so on. So. Uh, uh, yeah, they, it's hard for them to talk to family and friends. So weather reports, they can somehow get on board? Yeah, all by radio, yeah. This is, oh, this is the storm that uh, Mark and uh, Tommy and Abolish were in. It was quite a rotary one, very, very tricky. That's when we lost uh, uh, both Abolish and Gregor uh, got knocked out. And Mark survived that one, but he said he'd, he, he didn't think he was going to survive it, but he did. Luckily. Yeah. 18 boats started. Yes. How many are left? No. We've, we've tended to got six in the event, five are still sailing. Our Russian entry, Igor Zaretsky, stopped off in Albany because he had barnacles. Barnacles have been a big issue in this race. Uh, there's been infestation over the boat causing huge amount of drag. He, he was slowing down incredibly, had to stop and uh, uh, lift the boat out. He goes into what we call Chichester class if you make one stop. He's still in the event, but unfortunately while he's there, a health problem, he's back in Russia and he'll be going back to his boat in November to sail along. The other entrance, we've got five. So uh, at the back of the fleet is Tapio, okay, uh, on a, a Gear 36, which is the forerunner to the, uh, the um, Norda Swan 36, okay. He's got barnacle problems, going really slow. Um, he won't be back until probably June. He won't finish till June. Then we've got um, Isfan um, from uh, uh, or his American entry, uh, and uh, he's um, just up, uh, heading up towards Rio, okay. In a trade wind 35, we've got Uku, uh, uh, who's in a, another rust of 36. He's still uh, below the equator, heading up into the trade winds, the southeastern trades there. And then we've got the main game for now, which is Mark Slat's uh, Dutch entry and uh, Jean-Luc Bonnerty. And they're having a hell of a race right now. Uh, it's touch and go who's going to get there. So the finish is in La Sable alone, of course, uh, in France. And uh, Jean-Luc is a, a national hero, so there's a lot of people watching what goes on. They should or could finish, uh, you know, in a couple of weeks, around the 1st of February, and uh, they're having some fun at the moment. It's neck and neck. What's very interesting, because uh, I imagine being on the ocean on these ships can be very lonely. Yeah, it is. Um, they're, uh, you know, Mark's missing uh, family and friends, so is Jean-Luc. Um, and uh, same with Uku. Uku took off and he, he, he had two baby boys, twins, born just months before the start of the race. <laughs> and so... <laughs> There's lots of, lots of this, and the isolation is part of the deal with this race. Um, that's why we've restricted the use of satellite phones and all that sort of stuff. It's the way it was in 1968. Is there a risk when you decide not to have communication or communication except from the race committee outside? A risk for, for the health of the mind or? No, no, not really. Well, I mean, we monitor them. And there has been one occasion with one entrant where we were getting a bit concerned at the messages and the way it was happening. But uh, we, re we resolve that. Um, so not a safety risk, that's for sure. But uh, they have challenges. I mean, if you look at, you know, when every one of them have had huge up and down motions from being really depressed to being on top of the world, you know. And uh, again, you know, if you, if you haven't got it up here to keep going, you will find a reason to retire. You know, that's where the mind really keeps you moving forward. You know. How do you find out before a race, before starting this race, that you get the right mind to do this? Well, you know, I mean, it's a huge effort. There's a, a huge emotional effort to get to the start line. There's a huge physical effort. There's a financial situation. And we had at one point 30 entries uh, and 15 on the wait list, okay? 18 made it to the start line. You wouldn't be doing even getting that far if you weren't serious about it. So um, it's self-sorting, if you know what I mean. If they're not, if they don't make the start line, that's, that's cool. They've, they've filtered themselves out. And then after that, you know, losing those entrants in the, in the, um, Atlantic legs, that's another way it happens. So by the time they get to the Southern Ocean, uh, you're left with the ones that are quite dedicated.
there will be another edition of this race and you already said there's a lot of people that want to take part on this yeah absolutely it, it's quite incredible you know some people are saying oh you'll never get another entry you've got all these storms and all these dramas it's quite the reverse i mean uh, uh, we uh, the, in 2022 uh, there are two classes now it's the same sort of boats you've got here uh, and also another class a joshua replica class so um it's a replica of bernard mckessier's boat and uh, the rules are basically staying the same and uh, right now we're probably uh, going past half full and entries have only been open for a few months um, and it doesn't start until uh, august 21st in 2022 so yeah there's a lot of interest the, the following around the world has been quite strong i mean it's not like the volvo and so you know all that sort of stuff but for the organization and for the the nature of the adventure and the market the niche market we have which is ordinary sailors it's they're really passionate about what's happening and uh, you know we're very happy with the exposure we've got we didn't receive a major sponsor at all we've uh, got lasab delone in the in uh, france as our logistic partner handling everything there um so uh, we've basically been funding it ourselves but now uh, the interest is, is growing it's starting to turn <laughs> so you did look for uh, a sponsor in the beginning or, oh, yeah. or you said you you want to have one but nobody wanted yeah, to do definitely. it because yeah, maybe yeah. it's a little dangerous for the money putting into this race well you know it's interesting we wanted to start it in england but we couldn't get any passion happening there no real enthusiasm but uh we had a lot of friends in france and as soon as we mentioned it they said yep come this way so uh things have been really good and uh, um, then we had a few issues uh, uh getting underway but uh, the good news is that all the maritime authorities not only in france but around the world are very happy with the event and the french uh, maritime authorities have said that our golden globe race uh, notice of race safety arrangements on are the best i've ever seen for any event any sailing event in france so so we were quite happy with that and uh and now people get it and originally they didn't understand what the race was you know because it was a second edition 50 years later now everyone knows what it was and um uh, it's a real adventure it has an unknown outcome you know and uh, it's very human comparing the modern racing and your race and the, or the, maybe the old school racing what would you say what is better or maybe what are the good deals what are the bad deals about it well you know i mean it, it's not that, that any one event is better than the others it's just they're all different and that's the beauty of sailing i mean every boat's a compromise every race is sort of different and this is completely different the world has had before the start of this had never seen anything like it and the following and the comments and the passion from those that are there it's phenomenal it's it it really uh did we hope for that we didn't know whether it happened but it has and uh because it's real and ordinary it's not just pilots driving a plane you know or whatever it's it's one person in one boat living out their dream but it's all about human endeavor and challenge and pushing themselves to the limit and uh, i think the edition in 22 is going to be really uh, this one was good but wait till the next one <laughs> I was reading uh, an article about uh, sailing saying that there is a lot of people sitting uh, in their yacht club talking about racing, talking all, you know, all this uh, specialist talk that never really sailed and all this. So now there's no reason to say, uh, no, sorry, I, I know, but I can't afford it. I can't do it. It's a bit of um, pushing the people. Huh? Absolutely. It puts some people in some spots because you, you need a budget of about 120,000 euro to do this. That's about the, not even the cost of a mainsail for one of the other big boats, you know, <laughs> racing around the world. So 120,000 euro, that's, uh, in fact, it's less than that, sorry. It's, um, uh, well, yeah, 120,000 euro. And at the end of the race, you still have their production boats. If you want to get rid of the boat or you probably fall in love with it and go cruising for the Caribbean or something. But if you got rid of it and you sell it, The whole effort's probably going to cost you less than, you know, 50,000 euro or something to do an around the world yacht race and a challenge. And I get you right that you can have included in this 120,000 euro a rebuild of the boat? That's everything. Yeah, you buy your boat, you do the refit, put all the safety gear on it, get your entry fees, all that sort of stuff. It's, it's all there. So, uh, you know, it's, there's no excuses if you really want to do it. And we, there's some incredible backstories yet to be told, not only on... Well, on, on this race, you know, the way the people have got to the start. You know, Mark Slats is a, an amazing story. They all are. They're, they're different levels. Some have had sponsors, but you don't, the money does nothing in this race. You could have the biggest sponsor in the world, and you could be beaten by a guy that's got 100 grand, you know, 100,000 euro. It doesn't matter. It's a level playing field, and that's, that's part of the concept. What's very interesting, because just before your talk, we had here Axel Nobel, and they said if you want to 
win the race, you need to put more money into it. Yeah, no, no, this is all about preparation. It's very obvious. And in fact, I, I heard his talk and he said, the winner was all about their preparation. And for the GGR, it's three things. But preparation is incredibly important. Planning, uh, planning is, is critical. Preparation is incredibly important. And then the execution doing it is, is important as well. But you get the first two wrong, it, it's, it's all over. And the guys up the front now, um, Jean-Luc Vanity, for instance, um, it's all about his preparation and his background experience. But uh, yeah, it's achievable for anyone. So maybe to the audience, who would like to take part in this race? Oh. Yeah, we'll be talking after. <laughs> I think we're just about out of time because there's another two minutes. To no more excuses, eh? Wenn es Fragen gibt vom Publikum, dann könnten diese jetzt gestellt werden. Vielleicht möchten Sie direkt fragen, wie man gewinnt zum Beispiel. How do you win the race? That would be my last question. How do you win it? Yeah. Uh, enter. That's the first step. <laughs> There's no easy answer. <laughs> okay, so okay. you're very close to winning already. Yeah. So we've got one little two minute clip to, to run. Yeah. Good. Cool. We will start or end with another short video. Thanks for talking okay. here. Thank you.